Okay, guys, let's get started with the lecture today um, on self-fulfilling prophecies. But before we get that, uh, let me remind you, you know, now it's time for this online test. It's happening. Actually, it is online already. Uh, so I put it up there. Um, you find it on Blackboard. More precisely, you go on Blackboard into assessments. And there at the top link, you find take home test one. Yeah? So that's the test that you take. Um, I talked with some of my colleagues, or actually I talked with Sarah, she's told me that you guys must have done similar things with her in her class. So um, you should be familiar with it. But let me mention it nevertheless, you know, this test, oh, the speakers here, seriously. Um, the test is online and it's open until one o'clock on Monday. Yeah? So that's basically how it goes. So you have from now until one o'clock on Monday to complete that test. And if you don't do the test, for whatever reason, you don't get points. You know, that's as simple as that. You have 72 hours, there's a lot of time. Uh, so if something, you can take the test at home. So um, I think it should be doable. There are 20 questions in this test. 20 questions. And um, there are some instructions when you log into it as well. So uh, basically there are 20 questions. Each question will be presented to you after the other. Uh, so you need to uh, answer one question before you get to the next question. Um, the order of the question is, I'm not entirely sure, but it might be randomized so that some of you get different orders than others. The answer categories you need to have a close look at. Yeah. Uh, there are different kinds of questions. Most of them are multiple choice questions. Sometimes there's just one correct answer. And then the test, uh, the question will only allow you to, call, to, to select one correct answer. Sometimes there's more than one correct answer. In that case, you have to select all the correct answers. If you don't, you don't get the full points. There are two other kinds of questions. One question or two questions where you have to type in a number, basically. And another question, I think two questions I have in that, where you have to fill in the blanks in, of a text. Yeah? But hopefully this should be all self-explanatory. Yeah. Does it make sense or do you guys want me to show you how to find this on Blackboard? Yeah? You figure it out? Well, let me see. I might have it on here now anyway. So basically, you know, when you go on to assessment, here you go. Now you find up here, take home test. That's very straightforward. You click onto this thing, and then the test starts, and then you can actually begin the test. So there's a button down here, begin test. Okay, so there's a test. Well, I started it already for test runs, so I don't know, it asked me to continue. Um, and I get the instructions and stuff. And uh, anyway, so that's sort of where you find it. Yeah? You can, uh, now I because I started this test already, so I could, could actually revisit it in a way. But if you do that, you need to save your, uh, you need to save your answers. Yeah? Let's see how that goes. Any questions about this test? We are all good with it. We are all fine with it. Okay, you have until Monday, uh, Monday at one o'clock to figure it out and to submit your your answers. Yeah. Um, it, should, it should be set up in such a way that then you'll just, once you kind of log in again, that's how the system is set up. 
it just con just continue where you are. Yeah. If you saved your results as you go along, yeah, there are different buttons. There's kind of like a save button. Just press the save button, and then there's sort of like a, I don't know, click to the next question. It's basically I don't know, question one out of twenty, and next to it is an error. When you click on that error, you continue. You get to the next question. Okay. Is it based on just the main readings or further readings as well? It's um, the main readings. Yeah, in main readings and. There might be one or two questions where I ask you some stuff about the lectures. Yeah. But with the lecture, when you've been to the lectures, when you've done the readings, you should have no problem at all with this test. Mm -hmm. But as I said, you feel free to use the readings, feel free to use the lectures. You have the lecture slides, you have the videos. So um, you have everything. OK, so let's get started. Uh, another thing to say, uh, keep in mind, next week, Friday, there's no lecture. So next week we only have one lecture on Tuesday, but no lecture on Friday. Somehow I feel that this microphone is not working. I don't know. Do you guys hear me properly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 So this is sort of the stuff that I want to talk about today. Today we talk about self-fulfilling prophecies. What are self-fulfilling prophecies? And then I uh, jump into different. Uh, kinds of self-fulfilling processes. One is, I don't know, in, in, in groups, you know, like when, when something comes true that isn't true in a group due to behavior that we think that something is true. And then I have two examples where we revisit that, where we dig deeper into self-fulfilling prophecies, one in the context of education and the other one in the context of um, what we talked about last time as well, about uh, these uh, music lab experiments that Watts and others did where they artificially made something look popular and actually making it look popular even though it was not popular actually made it popular. And that's basically this lecture in a nutshell. Yeah? That's something that is not true but people falsely believe that it's true and because of that false belief they behave in a certain way which makes the actual thing come true. That's, that's a self-fulfilling self prophecy. And then, I don't know, we talk a little bit about why these things occur or, or what is required for them to occur and how we can actually use them. Yeah. Finally, I use these things all the time. Now, that's basically, I use them in my lectures. I use them in my lectures. I just tell myself all the time that you guys are incredibly intelligent. And by doing so, uh, I adjust my behavior. Uh, I behave differently to you. Yeah. And actually, there's research that showed exactly that. Yeah. So this is all based on solid research, in a way, which then ultimately makes students become better. Yeah because they realize, hang on, there's a guy actually talking to us or having high expectations on us. So as actually real research that showed that, I'm going to talk about that in the context of uh, uh, self-fulfilling prophecies in education, but let me first talk about self-fulfilling prophecies in general. Yeah. So uh, what are they? Well, they also might have come across different names of them. Sometimes it's called the Oedipus effect or bootstrapped induction, Bernaysian performity, Pygmalion effect. Yeah. But self-fulfilling prophecy is probably the one that, that uh, you, you might have heard most likely. And uh, based on the reading that you had for today, you know, Robert Merton, he actually introduced that into the literature. You know, surely this kind of stuff existed before already, you know, but Merton wrote about it, and he was the first to really write about it and uh, think about it. And so his definition is, a self-fulfilling prophecy is a false definition of the situation evoking a new behavior which makes the originally false conception true. Yeah? Well, when we take the steps, it's really straightforward. It's something is a false belief. Yeah. You think that something is true even though it's not. Now you have a false belief about something. Because of that, there's some action. You do something. And because of what you do, the false belief actually becomes true. Yeah? When we formalize this a little more, you know, you can kind of put it like this, I don't know, and, and in the other reading, it was not required, but it was in the further readings, Michael Biggs, he kind of formalizes it a little bit like that. He says, okay, first thing, a false belief, X believes that Y is P. Yeah? So X is, while in fact Y is not P. And I'm going to fill that in with an example in a second. Yeah? Then this, this formula comes clear to you. And because of that, you know, X believes that Y is P, X does something, X does B, and ultimately because X did this other thing, the originally false conception that Y is P becomes true. So that's the whole thing a little more formalized. So now let's add in some examples here. 
So now I'm going to plug in these variables. What is x, what is y, what is p, what is b. Yeah? Okay, now let's, here we are. So x is a teacher, and let's say y is a student, and p is having great academic ability. Yeah? While in fact, this is not really the case. And that's sort of like you know, the, the classic example where this stuff is being used, and actually I use it all the time in my teaching. So um, what would that mean? It would mean that now the teacher believes that the student is great, while in fact the student is not great. So this is a false belief. Because of that, there's some action that happens. In this case, it could be you know, that the teacher puts more effort in dealing with students, is more attentive, gives more feedback, explains things a little more, you know, uses a different vocabulary or whatnot. And that's a consequence now of the belief. Right? And if that happens, ultimately it could be that because of uh, more attention or because of you know, better preparation, better, better effort that is being put in, um, or other factors, you know, we'll talk about that later on, because of, because of that, of what happened in this action phase, that then the originally false conception becomes true. In this case, it could be that because of more attention, the student becomes great. So that's not the classic run-through of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It doesn't mean that this has to be happen all the time, right? But this is sort of like one of those generalized mechanisms that Merton talks about. Uh, and also in the introduction that you had to read of the text by Hedstrom and Spedberg, they also refer to Merton. Uh, they also refer to uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy as, um, as a mechanism to produce ultimately uh, um, outcomes here it could be that uh, you know students are great, students in a class perform well. But I come back to that example later on when I deal about uh, when I uh, when I talk about the the study where they actually did that back in the 1970s or 60s. Another example of self fulfilling prophecies you most likely uh, rings a bell to you is uh, about medication. Now you all heard about placebos. So if I apply the same logic. For this, you know, X believes that Y is P, while in fact uh, it is not the case. Yeah. So the patient could believe that uh, a drug improves health, even though it's just a fake drug, it's just a placebo, it doesn't do anything. And then because of that belief, because, I don't know, the patient thinks that now I finally have a drug that helps me, I, I get better, then the patient uh, think, thinks she feels better and does more sport, which ultimately, uh, because of more sport, improves the health of the patient. You see how this sort of like kind of messes up the cause and the effect of things, uh, so that um, actually the false belief about something, an error, an error can actually lead to something becoming true. And you know, people found this in education context or here in the placebo context. Finally, this morning, you know, when I was preparing for this lecture, I was googling around a little bit for other examples, and people wrote serious papers about this in the context of dating. So there's a paper in the journal of. Uh, personality is something like, I don't know, I can't remember the, where, where it was. Um, if you believe that somebody likes you, you behave differently towards that person, which then actually can cause that person to like you. So, self-fulfilling prophecies where something, um, where something, a false belief leads to some action, which then makes the false belief become true. <coughs> So what are the criteria for self-fulfilling prophecies? So what do we need to have for this to happen, for this to work out? Right? Um, you know, and now I'm citing Biggs, which was in the further readings for that. So he mentions two criteria. First of all, there needs to be some sort of causal sequence, like the ones that we just had before. You know, like, I don't know, um, teacher thinks that the students are great because of that the teacher does something. Right? And whatever does the teacher kind of leads to a change in behavior of the student. Right? So that's like a causal sequence. But then, for self to call this a self-fulfilling prophecy, at the end there needs to be a false belief to begin with. Right? So somebody misunderstands the situation. Right? Somebody thinks something even though it's not the case. You know, a teacher thinks that students are great even though they are not. Or um, you think that somebody doesn't like to date you uh, while in fact they would. Or you think that, I don't know, a drug uh, helps you while in fact it's just a fake drug. Yeah? So that's sort of like a false belief. And, uh, and then we have action. And because of that action, the false belief becomes true. 
Okay, so this can kind of lead to uh, to to scenarios, you know, where people kind of then at the end tell you uh, that they that they that they knew all the way long that this was sort of true, right? Because they say, well, obviously we have the proof, right? Obviously, the drug worked, right? Because I'm better now, or obviously I don't know the students were great because they do all great in the take-home test. Yeah? Um, so. People can fail to realize that it was their false belief and the action that resulted from it which made the original belief come true. So that's sort of like a logical mistake that people can easily make when they don't know about this idea or this concept of a self fulfilling prophecy. And, uh, and then this can uh, make people feel validated about their original belief and think, I knew it all the way long. Okay, so that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Let me now walk you through uh, another kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Now we talked about that in, in about individuals. You know, an individual does something, but um, I think a sociologist becomes interesting when we talk about more than two people. Yeah? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about self-fulfilling prophecies in groups. So instead of two people, we have now several people involved in this. Yeah? And the, the classic example that you might have come across here before is the one of a bank run. That you think that a bank goes insolvent, it means they don't have enough money anymore. Uh, so then what happens, people run to that bank, they withdraw all their money, and even though the bank was perfectly solvent, everything was fine to begin with, if everybody does that, at the end, the bank goes bust. So this is a self fulfilling prophecy. But now it's not just about a single individual, but it's about a sequence of individuals that do something and because others do something that kind of reinforces their beliefs and then they do something which reinforces the beliefs of others and then ultimately um, we have the outcome that confirms the originally false belief. So you know, now this is sort of how we had it before, you know, now we, but now I'm introducing different kinds of individuals. You know, instead of just X, I call this individual now X1. So X1 believes that Y is P, while in fact that is not the case, and then this person does something. And then um, now we are in the next step, and now uh, because of somebody else did something, somebody else withdrew money from the bank, now somebody else, another person, <coughs> now I call that person X2, believes that Y is P, could be that the bank is bust. Yeah? Well, in fact, it is still not the case, but then this person does something uh, and that kind of sets this chain into motion where then the individual action of, of, of each individual kind of reinforces or kind of makes other people have that false belief uh, and then they behave and then ultimately as a sequence of all these kind of things because of all these two, two all of these action components now not just one action component but all of these uh, action components that we have in sequence here uh, the originally false uh, conception comes true and the classic example in this case is um, I think Hetzram and Swedberg talked about that in, in their introductory chapter too but the classic example self-fulfilling prophecies is a bank run Nowadays, these things don't happen anymore because they're sort of people learned from, from lessons that we had uh, in the, I don't know, earlier in the 20th century and so on. And so when lots of people withdraw money from a bank, there's, at some point there's a blockage. People cannot really withdraw it right, anymore. And, uh, and, and that sort of like protect this a little bit. But the idea is that people kind of think that the bank is insolvent. They don't have enough money. They go there, they withdraw their money. And if everybody does that, it actually becomes true. So it's about bankruptcy. And, you know, it's actually not too long ago. Was it last year, you know, like, I don't know, at the height of the, of the crisis in Greece, uh, there were exactly mechanisms then in place that people couldn't withdraw more money from, from an ATM, right? Because if people would have done it, even though they were not insolvent at that moment yet, if everybody would have done it, they would have become insolvent. And that's sort of like this weird, weird thing where then where you see maybe individually it makes a lot of sense to withdraw your money, even when the bank is not insolvent, because then you're sort of in the safe bet, right? So individually you have an incentive to actually uh, follow up on this, to have some action, to do something, while if everybody does that, the false belief becomes true, right? So um, but we'll talk more about that later on, about why, why people behave upon false beliefs. So, but the classic example is that of a bank run. 
So now I'm plugging this into this scheme. And now again, we have instead of just one individual that does believe something and then does something, now we have like a sequence or several individuals that do something. So uh, in this case, you know, X1 would believe that the bank is insolvent. Insolvent means that the bank doesn't have enough money anymore. You know? And uh, while in fact the bank is solvent. You know? So they, they are good for the money. And, uh, but nevertheless, that's his false belief. So X1 goes ahead and withdraws the money from the bank. And because of now I see this person running to the bank and maybe, I don't know, I talk to the person, yeah, I withdrew just my money from the bank. And now this sort of, even when I kind of had an original idea that maybe the bank is solvent or not, like observing that behavior of others kind of makes me think even more that uh, the bank is insolvent. Maybe before I thought, okay, it's absolutely fine. But now I see people coming out of the bank and they tell me that they withdraw their money from it. I think, okay, maybe they, maybe they know more about me. Or maybe even not like that. Maybe now I'm even thinking, okay, if they withdraw their money, the bank has less money. So at some point, it might become insolvent. Yeah? So, so then the next person withdraws money from the bank. And the next person withdraws money from the bank and so on and so forth. And uh, ultimately, as a, as a consequence of that, the bank gets bust. Yeah? So the bank turns insolvent. So that's sort of the classic example of, uh, of a self-fulfilling prophecy when you have more than two individuals involved. And this is sort of where it becomes really fascinating as a sociologist, I think. Okay, so much about bank runs. Let me now jump into two examples where I talk about, um, mm, I don't know, self-fulfilling prophecies in, in a specific context, you know, where people did some studies about that. The first one is education. I already mentioned that a little bit. And the second one is really just based on one of the readings that you guys already had, which was on the cultural markets by uh, Salganik and Watts. You know, they did, this, they did a, a series of experiments and they did a very interesting experiment where they kind of made people believe that a song is popular while in fact it was not. But that false belief made them become a song more popular. Okay, so uh, self improvement in education. You know, this is sort of like a study based uh, on, on this... Uh, uh, a study based by Rosenthal and Jacobson, you know, published in the 1960s. Nowadays, you couldn't do these kind of things anymore. You know? If I would kind of run that, it would be highly unethical. You know? But at the time, what they did was the following setup. You know, they wanted to study self-fulfilling prophecies in the classroom in schools. So basically, what they did at the beginning of the year, they kind of made teachers overhear a conversation in the school that some of their students are talented, are especially gifted. While in fact, those students were not talented, or not more than, than any other one. But basically, there was like a, and this is sort of why it's unethical. Nowadays, you couldn't do that anymore. Nowadays, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, fake it and tell teachers that some of their students are incredibly bad or incredibly good. And yeah, that would be highly unethical. But, um, but back in the days, people did it. You know? So the teacher thought that some of their students are incredibly good, but they are late developers. So they are not there yet. Yeah? So it, it, it kind of looked like they did it, they, like their students did this psychological test, and that was sort of like the result of it, even though it was not the result. Yeah? But that's sort of what the, teachers, what the teachers were taught. So the teachers believed this ba uh, was based on an IQ test done to the students, but actually it was really random. Yeah? Some of the you know, 20 students were selected uh, by, um, by chance. So now there was a false belief. There was a false belief the teachers had that some of the students are incredibly clever. Okay, what happened now? So the school year passed by, and at the end of the year, those 20 children um, actually did indeed improve their IQ scores. Yeah, and they continued to do so for the next two years. So there was a huge difference, you know, much more than you would have expected to have just by chance. Yeah. So the belief became true. So how did that happen? Yeah, how did that actually <laughs> work out? Well, at the end, you know, as I told you, um, uh, the prophecy came true because the teachers responded differently to, uh, to those 20 students. You know, they give them more, more feedback, or sometimes they explain things a little more, or sometimes they were a little more challenging, or sometimes they were a little more encouraging, instead of just uh, knocking them down. And so the worst thing that you can do as a teacher is actually knock people down and say, oh, you're not going to understand this anyway. That's seriously, that's the worst thing you can do if you want them to, uh, if you want your students to learn. Regardless of whether students are clever or not, self-fulfilling prophecy actually kicks in. So, and then the students started to react to these different treatments by putting more effort into it. 
And there are different reasons why people might do that. Maybe because they think there are, there are expectations, I should meet those expectations. Or maybe they, they don't really know themselves how good or bad they are, you know, and suddenly somebody tells them they are good. So they get inspired and they, they actually do the work instead of just saying, okay, fuck this, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. So, and that eventually made the, uh, made the students improve. But it was fascinating, you know, just teachers had a false belief that led into feedback, which was basically the action component of the teachers, but then also action of the students, which ultimately made the students improve and get higher scores at the end of the year. So this is sort of now the, the sequence when we kind of put that in that uh, schema for self-fulfilling prophecy. Teacher believes that the student is great, when in fact this is not the case. Teacher puts more effort into it, and because of more attention, the student becomes great. He's saying, wow, this is fantastic. We can use that. We can use that to actually achieve good things. Yeah. We could use that ultimately to, um, to be better teachers. We can do that ultimately to uh, make the world a better place. Right? Well, these self-fulfilling prophecies, they can also backfire. And now I'm going to show you an example, and that's actually the one that Merton used, or when he wrote this paper in 1948, uh, he talked about um, racial differences in education. So that was the setup, you know, I don't know, uh, keep in mind, we are in the 1940s, 1950s in the US, highly segregated uh, blacks and whites. And, uh, and the example that Merton has is that at the time, you know, uh, educators believed that blacks are inferior. Well, obviously, I don't know, that is not the case. Yeah? That might be seem so trivial for us right now, and it is a no-brainer that there are no, uh, no genetic differences or any other ones uh, like that. Um, but back in the days, you know, some people actually thought that. Okay, so this is now from, from Merton, uh, from, from the reading that you had to do. Uh, so now we have a false belief. And because of that, you know, actually education funds were channeled into different neighborhoods. So basically neighborhoods where there were more white students received more government funding because they thought black students are bad anyway. So let's put our money onto the white students. So there you have sort of some action that kind of uh, um, followed from the false belief. And as a consequence of that, at the end of the day, you know, there was less funding available for schools with lots of black students, and uh, as a consequence of that, they actually did worse in tests at the end of the day. Yeah. And then people said, well, I can show you that uh, whites perform better in tests than blacks. So I proved it, right? No, this is sort of now where false belief triggers some action, which then can lead to the false belief come true, where it's actually something that is not something that we would desire, right? So that's actually something we would want to avoid here. Yeah. So self-fulfilling prophecies can also backfire, and they can also lead to situations that uh, are not beneficial. Again, like the bank run, there's also a situation that is not beneficial. Well, if I sort of apply my little magic here to improve everybody's test score in this class, that's great. Then I achieve my goal. But um, if the bank goes bust, or if uh, at some point we increase social inequality through a mechanism like this, that's not what we would have wanted to have. Okay, so that's not an example where the, where the self-fulfilling prophecy can actually backfire and can lead to negative outcomes. So now let me talk about the second example that I have with me, which are these cultural market studies. Now again, it's sort of the same readings that you guys already had. Keep in mind, they wrote a series of papers. This is sort of a summary paper of some of their experiments that they had. They had a paper in Science, 2006, another one in PNAS a little later, and I think there was another science paper on that. So it's highly, highly productive. And uh, remember the setup, you know, they basically set up a, a fake web, web, website, Music Lab, that's how it was called, it was run through Columbia University, where um, people or participants were presented with some music they could listen to, and then they wanted to rate it, and, and then, they, then they could rate it afterwards. And uh, Last time we talked about that in the context of uh, social influence, you know, that the readings that other people had made had an influence on, 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 on individuals. You know, when other people rated something high, then, uh, uh, then people started to rate this song highly and, and vice versa. So this fake website, 
participant could listen to that. We already had that before, and they controlled the information that participants received about the behavior. Yeah, and that's sort of like the original setup of the study. You know, go to the website, listen to the song Rate, and then we had this social influence condition where then half of the people were sort of diverted, and, and this half then kind of learned about the ratings of others before they did their ratings. That was sort of like the treatment that we had. And we had these different worlds and so on. You know, it channeled into all these different things. OK, so far so good. There's nothing new here. But uh, in one of the experiments, now what they did, sneaky little bastards as they were, they inverted, they inverted uh, the, the ratings. They inverted the influence world. What does it mean? Yeah. They basically made a song that was highly popular at a certain moment, right, over time. They made it look as if it was the worst popular song at this moment in time. And they made the best song at this moment in time, the, they made the worst song at this moment in time look like it was the best song at this moment in time. Yeah. So basically, this is sort of how this, how this evolved. You know, imagine, I don't know, there are like, I don't know, in this case, around 3,000 people that participated in this. Now we are talking about this particular world. Now one of those different groups, one of these eight different groups, where people were challenged, uh, channeled in, and they learned about what other people said. And now it's not about comparing this against when people don't hear about what other people uh, said, but now they basically let this evolve, right? So, and this is sort of now the, the number of times. Now you see the popularity of the song that was the highest rated and the song that was the lowest rated. Now this is basically just how many times was this song downloaded after uh, an X amount of people actually uh, um, had the chance to download songs yeah, and listen to it. But now at this moment, so basically they had a cutoff point here, and now they flipped these ratings around. So they made the first song, now actually you see um, solid lines and you see dashed lines. So when you see the, 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 uh, the solid line, this is sort of how it evolved when they didn't change things around. And now the, solid, the dashed lines, that's sort of how it evolved when they flipped those ratings around. Yeah, so they basically gave the rating of the best song to the worst song, and they gave the ratings of the worst song to the best song. It was the same song. That's sort of the idea here. That's still the same song. So all the thing that is different is that now you kind of tell people that a song is popular, while in fact it's actually not. False belief. And then you want to see if there's some action which ultimately makes it become true. Yeah. And, and you see this huge difference. So when you kind of look at the solid uh, line for, for the, um, how this first song evolved, uh, basically here. So this is sort of now uh, the first song, and this is sort of how it, they split it up into different groups and, and kind of how it kind of went on to become popular. Yeah. And this is sort of how it went on to become even more popular when they gave them the, re the ratings from, from this bad song. So this is now the difference that is due to people thinking that something is popular while in fact it is not. Now, or actually, in this case, this is the, the difference between people thinking that something is unpopular while in fact it is popular. And here, the reverse. You know, suddenly, like, the bad song became very popular just because people were told that it's popular. Yeah, again, it's a false belief. It was not really good, yeah. at least to what those other people had said before. Yeah. And then suddenly it changed. So they did the same thing then with the second song and the, and, and the 47 song. So basically just flip things around, you know, the best with the worst, or the second best with the second worst, and so on. And findings were there as well. So basically, inverting the downloads of songs communicated to others made the artificially highly appreciated songs receive more downloads. And in reverse, uh, artificially lowly appreciated songs received fewer downloads, just because artificially something was set up to be wrong. Yeah. And now we, in the context of self fulfilling prophecies, now you have a false belief, some action that kind of makes the false belief come true. Right? You have the false belief that a song is popular, but in fact it is not. People then think it's popular, so they start doing something. Influence kicks in, and they actually go and listen to that song because they think it's popular, which ultimately makes that song popular. OK, so that's self-fulfilling prophecies in two, uh, in two, uh, with two examples. Let's talk a little bit about why self-fulfilling prophecies occur or what is sort of required uh, for them to, to, to happen. Well, now you can actually tease this apart. 
you know, as we already uh, talked about now several times, you need to start, you need to have a false belief, yeah, something that is actually not true, while in fact people think it is true. And you know, actually that happens quite a lot, you know, like people are not always accurate in their perception of the world. Sometimes there's just some random error in it. Sometimes people just, some just get it wrong. And now what I'm telling you here is that this actually matters. So sometimes actually the error or the false belief uh, can actually really matter when people behave according to what they believe in. And then we have, um, uh, uh, and, and, and then the next thing is, so when people then believe in something and they kind of start behaving in it, uh, then uh, the second thing is that uh, people then, or another question that we can have is why uh, do people, why do specific behaviors then subsequently fulfill their original belief? You know, how can that then actually happen? Okay, and uh, Merton, Merton mentions um, Thomas' theorem, which is funny, which is not me, but uh, somebody else. Uh, quote, but nevertheless it made an important, uh, and that's why I became a sociologist. You know, I did, I did something completely different before, but I, had, uh, I did computer science before I did this. But then I kind of realized, hang on, there's sort of all this stuff that I'm quite excited about, that I'm wondered about, and this was actually very much at the center of it. And uh, Thomas' theorem is, if men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. That's a quote. Yeah? long quote, 1920s, and so on. But that's exactly at the core of this. Yeah? So when people kind of um, falsely believe something, it might actually have real implications for what they do and then for the world as a whole. So now we have the questions, why do people um, falsely, why do people have false beliefs and behave according to them? And then why do these uh, specific behaviors then fulfill the original belief? So let's get started with the first one. Why do people have false beliefs and behave according to them? Well, first of all, people can make errors, and they can make mistakes, they can have wrong, uh, um, uh, uh, there can be, can be just a, 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 a faulty judgment, yeah, that you think something is true, while in fact it's not really the case. But there can be other factors that kind of play a role here. And one mentioned in the literature is uh, a power imbalance. Power imbalance. Yeah? So you, you could just um, believe in what I tell you, because I'm supposed to know shit. Yeah? So I'm standing here, I just tell you. Yeah? And there's a, there's a power imbalance. Because of that, there could be a false belief that something is true, even though it is not the case. Or it could be, um, and then uh, because of that, then you start you start doing something. Yeah. So I tell you that I don't know. This is how the world works, and even though you don't think so, but you start doing it yeah, because you think, okay, I don't know. I'm supposed to know it, yeah? and you're supposed to follow my advice. Another reason why people might have false beliefs and behave according to them is uh, maybe the costs of making mistakes are asymmetric. Well, what do we mean by that? Well. The example here is that of a bank and withdrawing money from a bank. The bank might be solvent, it might not be solvent. If you withdraw the money, that doesn't change anything for you. You still have the money. But if you don't withdraw the money, you leave it with the bank, and the bank is fine, it's absolutely fine. But if the bank is bust, if for whatever reason, even though you might not think it is bust, yeah? But if it is insolvent, then uh, making this mistake of not withdrawing your money is incredibly costly because you don't get your money back. Yeah? So there's now an asymmetry in, uh, in the costs for making mistakes. Another reason could be I could be perfectly aware that there's a false belief. Uh, and, uh, and that people behave according to something that is not true, but it could still make sense for me to act in a similar way. And the example here is the one of a Ponzi scheme. Has anybody of you heard of the Ponzi scheme? Well, there was this guy, Madoff, he ran that a few years back. It's so basically, I would promise you 20% returns if you give me a thousand euros. Yeah? That sort of would be an outlandish high number or even 50%. And maybe two of you say, oh, let's do this. Yeah? 
he seems to be a clever guy, maybe he can do something and kind of give me a high return on my investments, and like 50%. So what I do, I get, you, get your money, and actually I give you 50% of your money back on the top of it. You know? So maybe at the beginning I might then, I don't know, have to take a loan myself, but I give you the 50% back. And then you tell your friends, this guy is amazing, he gives me 50% of my returns. And then each one of the two people finds another two people, another five people, they give me then their money. Yeah. And then I use their money to actually refinance the 50% that I've given to you. Yeah. And then for you it's actually true. You got 50% return on your money. And then there are these other 10 people now that say, okay, now let's get some money. And uh, this guy promises us 50%. So now actually, you know, they might recommend some other people who then give me their money. And then I use their money to give the 50% to the second group of people, basically your direct friends. Yeah. That's sort of like a Ponzi scheme. It happened a few times. You know, this guy is now in jail. Uh, but if you Google that, it's kind of like, a, like, an, like, an, like one of those um, major frauds yeah, uh, that, that can happen. So in this case, I can gain something from believing in the false belief. Yeah, or actually, you can gain something from believing in the false belief. If you believe that I'm going to give you 50% return on your investment, actually, you will get it. Yeah? even though it might be false. Yeah. So there can be th these scenarios where it actually uh, pays to um, believe in something that is false. Okay, so the second question that we have is now we kind of talked a little bit about you know, people have false beliefs, they make just errors, mistakes and whatnot, and then they behave according to them. But why should that actually change the original belief? Why should that happen? Well, you know, there are different theories out there, and, and now this is much more, I don't know, psychological now sometimes, you know, about how individuals adjust and do their behavior. But in the context of learning or education, we know studies showed that there's something called response expectancy. Uh, students who accept the false belief from the teacher that she's bad in math might be anxious in a math exam, which degrades performance. So if I tell you guys that you suck, uh, some of you might actually believe in it and then you actually get anxious in the exam for Monday, and then you do worse. While if I tell you guys you are great, you can actually really do it. Actually, yeah, now I really believe it, but even without that, because I don't know, if you kind of did the, the homework and so on, you're, you're absolutely fine. Uh, uh, then you are less anxious about this test. You don't react in a way that you're kind of freaking out over the weekend. You just do the test, and it will be fine. Another example is uh, when, um, when the payoff structure dramatically changes, so torture, but let me jump over that. Uh, there could be a gap between self-image and the image of others. So experimental studies, they showed that when instructors force the belief that some students are promising and behaved accordingly, that then the students feel that they're being, tr being treated better than they actually should be. Yeah? And then kind of they wanted to reduce that diff difference again. So they, there was a study about the Israeli army where um, basically the commanders kind of had really high expectations or they actually you know, told their troops, you can do this, while the soldiers thought, okay, actually we can't do that, but this guy actually believes in us, couldn't do this. So that's sort of now the difference between the self-image and the image of others, and, uh, and then they actually you know, put more effort into it, yeah, which then actually... Uh, made them achieve their goal. But you can see we can learn actually quite a lot from this and actually we can actually use this. Yeah? And uh, you know, business folks, they love this kind of shit. Um, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly useful um, in many different ways. So my recommendation to you guys is high expectations are the key to everything, not just towards yourself. Of course, they're sort of like, I don't know if you have too much, and I've seen that happening too. But then people, they, they block and they kind of freak out. But there's a theory behind that about self-fulfilling prophecies. Yeah. Okay, so that's the reading for the next lecture, which is not on, which is on Tuesday. Yeah, on success breeds success dynamics. Okay, thanks very much. Good luck with the test. Until